Good evening, everyone, and welcome to YAR Geek Challenge Season 10 Explore Webinar Series. So in this series of uh, YAR Geek Challenge, we have introduced a new segment where we have a series of webinar uh, through which we are trying to identify different problems in different fields. So through that, uh, our audience and the participants can find some opportunities uh, where there are some problems to be solved uh, in the specific fields. So in that line today, uh, we have the uh, session on MedTech where we have two experts here to share their experience and knowledge and to point out some problems which needs to be solved. So let me uh, introduce our uh, panelists today. Uh, we have uh, Indran Indrakrishnan, who is a clinical professor of medicine at Imori University School of Medicine and J. Krishnan Rajagobala Sharma, CEO and co-founder of Arogya Life Systems. So uh, they will be talking about problems in the uh, medical domain uh, this evening. So Indran, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Abarna, uh, for introducing me and giving me an opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you. So the information technology, uh, I call it a parasitic science. Why do I say this? Because it encroaches into all the fields. You just name it, music, medicine, science, astrology, transportation, everything, and certainly the medicine is no exception. And the uh, impact of information technology had on, or has on uh, healthcare is enormous. I just want to touch base with few items, a few things which where you can benefit, the information technology can benefit uh, the medical science and vice versa. Uh, so there are no PowerPoint presentations. I'm just gonna to talk to you freely um, and you can stop me at any time. Uh, a few subjects or few topics where it should be some kind of interest to you. Uh, broadly speaking, um, there are human errors uh, when it comes to healthcare. And uh, you all can stop it or at least reduce it. I'll talk to you a little bit more. Then facilitate and coordinate the patient care in a large aspect when there are thousands and thousands and thousands of patients treated in different hospitals and uh, healthcare facilities. You can coordinate through the information technology. And tracking the data is much easier from or through the IT. And the healthcare accessibility, you don't have to have a doctor or other patient visit the doctor. You can. Uh, do a lot of things from making the diagnosis, even treatment, probiotic surgery uh, by the information technology or through information technology and monitoring the patient's uh, some uh, numbers like uh, blood pressure, heart rate, blood sugar, those things you can monitor uh, at a distance through the ITV call it wearables, uh, even not just heart rate, but heart rhythms, uh, abnormal rhythms. And then uh, telehealth, where Kind of same thing what I mentioned before. Uh, your patient can access to the uh, uh, healthcare provider, not necessarily visiting the uh, uh, the site of the doctor's place. So just uh, over the um, computer. And finally, the cyber security. Whenever there's too much of data in the uh, uh, online, in the information technology, there's always going to be ransomware attacks, facing stealing, hackers, et cetera, et cetera. It's a huge subject. We'll come to that last. So coming back to the human errors. So what exactly the human errors? What happens? So going back, the medicine, thousands of years ago, it's an art. The way they practice was an art. Then it became science in the last couple of hundred years. And then now the IT, the information technology is helping it to sharpen, or fine tune the way it provides uh, treatment or rather diagnosis and treatment of the patients. So the information technology can make the human errors less. Human errors, who make the human errors? You're looking at me, that's me. I make the errors, I'm a human. So however good training I had or however bright I am, still I can make errors. The simplest example is prescriptions. You might have heard this old joke where a patient takes a prescription to a pharmacist and the pharmacist says, hey, this prescription is fake. I don't believe this. And the patient asks, why? And then the pharmacist says, oh, I can read the doctor's handwriting very well. It can be a real doctor. It must be a fake doctor. That's a joke, but it can be a serious issue to the patient if the wrong medicine. 
uh, the human errors and, uh, and and then the prescription errors going to uh, a deeper issue when the patient has a very, very bad reaction. It is a very important aspect. And in the US, to a certain extent, it's become mandate that we send the prescription to online. It's called e-prescription, where the mistakes are very, very, very less compared to handwritten prescription in terms of names of the medication, how frequent you take, and then the dosage. The software is connected to all the pharmacies in the US. I can sit in my home or sit in my office or the hospital. I can send the prescription to anywhere in the United States, any pharmacies, without writing a prescription. That's a revolving subject, but it's getting better and better. And uh, because of the government, or US government had made it to a mandatory to a certain extent with the penalties if the physicians do not use the uh, e subscription or rather prescription, then um, uh, they, 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 they kind of get some kind of penalty in terms of uh, their salary or reimbursement. The other human error I just want to touch base is, is in my, close to my heart. Uh, let me talk about this a little bit in more detail. This is AI. Artificial intelligence is a huge, huge subject, but let me explain to you in my specialty how it helps or how it's going to help. It is still in the infancy stage in United States, so you can, can do a lot of things on this uh, AI. So what is AI in um, our specialty? So I'm a gastroenterologist, so my um, toy, play toys is videoscopes. We get to the human body and look into everywhere. Stomach, esophagus, bowel, all kind of places. We look for the um, diagnosis, tumor, cancer, lesion, disease, everything. And sometimes we treat if necessary. So how do we recognize these um, tumors and lesions, polyps and all kind of um, uh, abnormal things? How do we know those are there? Or those are the ones which we think that they are there? because we were trained. When we were in the medical school and later on in the specialty training, we were taught by our mentors. This is all the cancer looks like. This is all the polyp looks like. This is how a lesion looks like. This is how a disease looks like. So we were trained. Our brain gets the training. Our brain stores all the information and the more the training, the better the experience and more data we have in the brain. And now when I practice medicine, when I do the, all these videoscopes, I know, oh, this is a cancer. This is a polyp, or oh, this is a lesion, this is a disease. Oh, this is Crohn's disease, this is colitis. Oh, this is nothing to worry about. So my brain tells me because I've been trained, but we can make errors. My brain's not perfect. No human brain's perfect. So how does the computer, information technology come to place? So we train the computer the information technology aspects supply so many thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of pictures, three dimensional pictures into this system. And this particular system is integrated into our videoscopes. And when we do the videoscopes into the human body, in addition to our own eyes and the brain, recognizing a lesion, the computer tells us, oh, by the way, you missed this. Oh, this is a polyp, oh, this is a cancer, you missed it. Oh, this is not, that's a beauty. So again, this is a, in a very, very early stage and um, out of thousands of uh, endoscopy centers in the United States, uh, probably a handful of uh, uh, scopes uh, centers are using this, especially university centers are using this information technology, the AI aspect, there's a lot to develop and big market, I'm gonna say good big market, I'm, I'm going to develop, uh, I'm going to integrate in this uh, uh, AI into my endoscopy center very soon. Uh, let me show you something, uh, you can see, this is what we call computer added polyp detection. Uh, it's a startup cost about half a million dollars and you can see how much is uh, cost and hopefully this one will come down uh, as we expand and lots of people start using it. Uh, this is information technology in AI, but AI is a lot of applications. This is just one aspect of just touch base because it's an infant stage in our endoscopy, a video endoscopy side. So that is 
number two in human errors I've just mentioned. Then tracking, uh, so facilitating the data or coordinating patient care. So let's go back to a scenario where you are, or one of the patients went to Colbovilla Hospital with some stomach pains or chest pain or whatever. Patient get admitted, get all kind of tests done, discharge. And a few months later, the patients moved to say, Vaunia and get the same problem or some other issues. He's at the hospital, Vaunia Hospital, because the same issue. The Vaunia Hospital had left no information about what happened in Kalgoyla Hospital. And patient may not know what exactly was done, what tests were done, the results of the test, and the what diagnosis was made. This integrated system, what we have in the United States, not to 100%, but to a certain extent, where one hospital can access the other hospital data easily and or, or any other healthcare institutions. So to give an example, VA hospital, that's veteran administration where the retired army, because they, uh, they, they go there for treatment. It is under one integrated system for healthcare records. They can access wherever they want to, whether you're in California, whether you're in New York or Florida, whichever, or Chicago, whichever place you can access. It can be done in any hospitals, any healthcare institution, as long as there's an integrated system. Uh, it's difficult in the private sector, but uh, government hospitals, they all work under just one Ministry of Health in some countries, including Sri Lanka. And uh, this can be done. This is very helpful to the patients for the patients and also the healthcare providers in terms of making the diagnosis and uh, not to repeat the investigations again and also not to make the wrong diagnosis and make it much easier and quicker. That is to facilitate and coordinate the patient care. Then the healthcare accessibility, I mentioned about uh, the patients uh, in the rural area or not so in the major towns, how they can get access to the specialist. It is the norm that the patient has to go to the hospital or doctor's office to see the doctor and be examined or rather first talk to them and then examine, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, and make the diagnosis and management. So with the telehealth, we are able to see the patient at a distance from home sometimes. It's become more uh, for kind of popular after this COVID-19 situation, where you can see the patient through the video call, ask questions. It's, a, it's under uh, the privacy situation, so it's not that it's, everybody can see. So, and um, provide the treatment without much of a uh, trouble to the patients. That is one way of handling uh, the patient care in terms of making the diagnosis. And the second aspect is providing the treatment. The typically you see the surgery is done by the surgeon with their own hands. Now you have robotic surgeries. Whether you have the gallbladder surgery or you remove the uterus or prostate surgery, even heart surgery can be done by robotic. And where the, the doctor, the surgeon operates the robotic uh, instruments, the distance in remotely. These are some of the examples of where the, the healthcare accessibility is much easier for the patients and make it uh, much more precise too uh, for the doctors uh, in terms of management. Tracking the data. This is more into science and uh, making uh, uh, better science. We call it um, uh, informed uh, medicine. Certain diseases have qualities which we can improve in terms of, we can improve the, um, uh, the outcome and also the management by looking at the disease in very detail. If a particular condition has, say there are thousands and thousands of patients have this particular condition, one can analyze the data, detail, the age group and the demographic whether the patient smoked or the patient is exposed to certain uh, chemicals, et cetera, et cetera, and come out with some kind of a answer why these people are getting 
this particular condition or disease, and then how we can prevent or manage the tracking data, the information technology hub. Instead of looking at the each and every chart, if we enter all this information into the uh, system, there is very easy. It, it, it can take only a few minutes to uh, get the data compared to uh, days and months and years to uh, look at each and every chart. Then comes these wearables. It's become very, very popular now, even, uh, even uh, developing countries. Wearables where you wear certain gadgets in your body, which can track your vitals and remotely send to, send to the, uh, the healthcare provider, which is the space of the doctors, like your heart rate, uh, rather heart rhythm. People who have intermittent heart rhythm problems, it comes and goes. Not that every time or uh, all the time they have this problem, but it just comes and goes. It's very hard to make a diagnosis and it comes and goes. So they wear this technique, uh, sorry, the gadget and the, the technology has advanced in so good. The doctor in a remote place from his home or from the hospital, from the office can monitor this particular person's heart rhythm continuously. And uh, the doctor gets the, um, uh, the indication that the rhythm is abnormal at times, the date and time, everything. It is one example, but there are many, many examples, blood sugar, oxygen saturations, a lot of things. So wearable, this is a very common commodity now uh, in not only Western countries and other places too. And something you can uh, uh, get this expanded into other areas too. The final thing is the uh, cybersecurity. There is a shortage of cybersecurity personnel in the United States. We can we need another one third of the the manpower uh, in this country to make the cybersecurity it's a safe matter in this country. So it's how bad it is. Wherever there is too much of data information in the online, in any subject, any specialty, any field, there's always, like I said before, ransomware, phishing, stealing, hacking, lots of things happen. And healthcare workers or other hospitals and healthcare institutions are no exception. Time to time, thousands and thousands of data are stolen. Either this for their own benefits, it's including this uh, credit card numbers, social security uh, numbers, et cetera, et cetera. But also sometimes they do the ransomware, they steal the patient data from the hospital or the healthcare institution and the ransomware. They say, hey, we are gonna release to the public unless you give us a few million dollars. It's happened in the hospitals, not frequently, but here and there I hear, and we are aware. One example I can tell you has happened recently, not uh, healthcare, but uh, in the uh, gasoline industry, uh, petrol, in Sri Lanka called petrol. So just a few months back, uh, petrol pumps, which supply this costly, the east coast of the United States, got hacked. So ransomware. There was hardly any supply of petrol. The many, many uh, uh, cities, the coastal uh, uh, or east coast uh, states, and um, it was a standstill. There were the, the the petrol price went up, and people are suffering. They could not drive. They could not get anything done. And finally, the uh, the petrol company, the the corporation, it paid few million dollars to the ransom people to get out of the situation. That bad it is, and it happened in the other places too. So cyber security is something you can expand, this particular field you can expand and uh, make it your, your, your job or your entrepreneurship can uh, help in the cyber security. Again, as I said, there's a big time shortage in the United States uh, for cyber security. That's not even of given um, institutions to teach to educate the cybersecurity personnel. That's bad it is. So this is all I actually want to say, basically, uh, I want to make it brief. Uh, we can keep on talking over a long time on this subject of uh, information technology and uh, uh, the healthcare. But uh, these are the few uh, topics I want to touch base uh, 
we are, you can expand, but some of them are already existent in a smaller scale. You can get better, you can expand it, you can make it better, or you can branch from what I said to go to a different area. And uh, again, it, it benefits the healthcare field and also you can benefit from this too. Thank you, Abana. Thank you very much uh, for that very insightful uh, information. Uh, so once uh, Jay Krishnan also finish uh, his um, uh, presenting uh, presentation, then we can take, take up some questions. Uh, Jay Krishnan, over to you, you can continue. You're on mute. Thank you, Rana. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Yes, I can see. Right, okay. So um, I think I will add uh, on top of what uh, Dr. Entran says, so most of this. Uh, major areas he has covered on this medtech uh, when it comes to opportunities side. So I'll quickly grab that thing and I will go through what I have prepared from my side. Now, when it comes to medtech business, right? So these are some interesting facts I found in the researches and all. So the global healthcare spending is 10 trillion, right? That's the that mean. 10 trillion US dollars. That means a trillion is a million million, right? This is the cost of healthcare. So the another fact is um, IoT, the internet of things can lower the cost operational and clinical inefficiencies. Uh, the cost of uh, these inefficiencies by 100 billion US dollar per year, right? This is one of the fact and there are over 780,000 companies in US healthcare sector, but right? these are healthcare companies in the US only based on some researchers. So this tells you, right, what is medtech, the opportunities and the size of the market and how big it is for you to explore, right? So Having said these kind of interesting facts that I can, we can list down so many interesting facts in this, uh, this healthcare tech and the med tech. And I'm also pointing here in this healthcare industry, I use the word healthcare industry, mostly med tech and healthcare industry is kind of interchangeable. So since I am from healthcare industry, I'm using the word I'm, I'm familiar with. Now, the, there is a there is a slowness in modernizing on the healthcare industry because they have identified three major reasons. One is that healthcare industry is complex than anything, any other industries. When you come to healthcare, it has a lot of dynamics. It has a lot of problems. It has a lot of very unclear, big boundaries and. The people don't know how to modernize these things, right? How to digitize, how to make it smart. The process engineering takes a lot and a lot of time to understand what the solution that you're going to address for the problem. And second thing is it's risk averse. That means that you cannot try out something. You cannot trial and error in the production. Right. You can't go and say, I'm going to test my new device with some patient. There are, there are clinical trials that you want to do. I think now most of the people are much familiar what is clinical, clinical trial, right? That we were waiting for the COVID vaccine is a good example. It has been over two years right now. It took around 18 months for the clinical trial to, um, uh, to succeed and bring it to the production to use the public usage. So even though there is a pandemic, right, to get a, a, a vaccination, it took around one year to 16, one year to 18 months, right, one and one and a half years for the clinical trials to uh, find the data because 
they act on the facts, right? Based on the scientific facts. You cannot just go and give an idea in the medical industry. And it's highly regulated. There are a lot of regulations. Now, even if you want to put, if you want to find um, a solution and you found a uh, invented uh, device, then you have to get the approval from FDA. And there are based on the different areas and regions, there are several regulations um, for you to enter into the metex. So these are the fun facts, interesting facts, and the, the problems or the risks in this uh, uh, metex. So I'm just sharing these two things to give you a sense of what is, what is this medical uh, technology industry and all. So understanding these two, or the interesting and the, the risk factors, let's go through, I, I'll quickly finish these things because most of the things that Dr. Indran has covered. Now, I'm just going through, there is an internet of medical things, right? So clinical trial, drugs, disclosure, manufacturing, supply chain to remote patient monitoring. You're introducing new and new devices that's connected to each other, passing information here and there, get a better understanding of the uh, environment. This is the Internet of Medical Things, one area. Another area is the precision medicine that we call it genomics, right? Understanding the DNA of the patient, going into deep uh, atomic level to figure out how to map to understand certain diseases. And then this electronic medical record, this is, this is, the key and interesting core fact of this, the, the fact of this uh, healthcare industry, the data that you are collecting. Simply, if you have a data of the diagnosis over past years on an area, you know what kind of diseases are coming, for why it's coming, which time the data, which time which diseases are coming, what kind of drugs are making, what kind of diseases, what is the diabetic index of this. Uh, um, the, the society, what really causes uh, uh, health issues for the people, so you can understand the pattern. So this is a huge area and very interesting. And uh, remember, you have the same risks and the opportunities here, including privacy and collecting data, accuracy of the data. There are so many things that you have to explore here, right? And then, as he said, this remote patient monitoring is becoming the the top-notch thing right now that now haven't now now last two years given the COVID, uh, now the travelings are restricted. Doctors are afraid to meet patient face to face until otherwise there is a real reason to meet. There is a lot of areas that can be sorted by this remote communication, right? And then biosensors. Now these wearable embedded integrated things. Um, um, that that understand the patient's uh, psychochemical makeups and and this precision target drug treatments. This is one another area, and uh, then the virtual reality and augmented reality. This is an interesting thing. Now you can see wherever the new technology is coming, that that medical the healthcare industry has a huge opening to use it in different different ways, right? So I'm just giving you a 10, 20 different areas. Uh, and I'm connecting how these things can be used in the healthcare industry. And, and I'm, I'm letting you to open your mind and see whether if there is a new technology that's not, not yet into a ground or maybe in the future, you have to figure out how you can map it to the healthcare industry. That, that's an interesting fact. So if you take this VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality, right? There is, there is a... The, the, the reason that why we use it, the areas we use in the medic, medic if you take the healthcare, it's a complex, it, it has a low margin for errors, right? Then you can adapt this AR and VR to train the people, right? Medical training, medical analysis, and then visualize internals of the anatomics, right? In a better way, rather than, now whatever you are seeing in a screen is two dimensional. Right. When you have an augmented reality, or when you have a virtual reality, it gives you a three-dimensional view, right? So that's that's one another way. And blockchain, you know, it's it's going everywhere. It started from finance, but if you if you the, the bitcoins 
the, the, the technology behind the bitcoins now it has a uh, data privacy to uh, data traceability are the, the, the key key things that is used in the uh, can be used in the um, uh, health tech is basically one of the important usage is the patient records tracking these clinical medical trials right and then the electronic medical records so these need a sensitive information and the security and also there is a large amount of complex calculations you have to use so that that solves by the blockchain and the wearable where you give patients power to track their health at home or wherever they are coming you give some bands or something and it start getting some information on the move and the ai as he dr england said there's a lot of things i just want to point out one interesting fact on ai google's deep mind you know the deep mind is um google like what deep mind is an ai company and a couple of years ago, this British National Health Services, the NHS, you might mean, you might know the UK healthcare system. They have given permission to analyze these 1.6 million data to Google. So you can see where this healthcare is going. There is a real need because the Google DeepMind has the best ever AI that can solve real problems, right? So this data sharing is slowly breaking this privacy and the norms of sharing a patient's data to a third party right so they are slowly breaking it and giving an anonymous data but it's not actually breaking it it's a debatable thing but an anonymized data has been shared with google to get the real power of ai to get the usability and to make a meaningful analysis of the huge amount of data they have, uh, right? And um, then cybersecurity, as Dr. Say, it's it, it's the more vulnerable ever ever feel in in the healthcare. And then the patient's expectation of the privacy, right? If I'm giving my data to a third party or a or a healthcare provider, uh, the privacy and the security that I'm expecting about my sensitive data is making cybersecurity another area. And this 3D printing, right? This is very interesting, right? You can give a 3D visual analysis of a human brain for the people to better understand how, how things are um, stipulated inside, right? A liver tissue printing. Likewise, this, 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 uh, is medical device testing right so from the production to testing to the quality control now it's it's 3d printing is taking over and the robots robotics is i think it's uh, most of the people knows that the the surgical robot care robots and assisting nurses right so there are many simple things like collecting blood sample a specimen from a patient but it's it's it, there's a huge amount of data you have to repeat and repeat this operation collecting blood sample that can be done by robotic that make a lot of value addition uh, to the system so these are the areas um, that you can explore and uh, i just want to go into a little bit uh, of the teams who are coming to your IT hub uh, some points to consider before uh, you enter in the mid, mid, mid tech, right? Um, now, just one important fact most of this uh, mid tech startup starts with a platform concept, right? We have everything uh, in the healthcare industry, we can do everything. That's not going to work, right? You have to focus or die. You have to take into a specific problem in detail and start with that and go and pitch for investment. Uh, and uh, then you need to go with the prototype and the feasibility data study for the investors. For example, what is the minimal viable product that we can take into a clinical trial or I can take it to market? Or oh, what is the specification will be enough to say, satisfy an important part of an unmet need? Right, you have to go with this information, uh, with the prototype you have, and with some data 
that supports that you have a business. If you don't go with this thing, chances are getting an even an angel investor investing on you is very less, right? And uh, then the intellectual property is a key. Now, now when it comes to healthcare, normally when it comes to a startup or when, when people are coming with idea, they are coming with this intellectual property concept. But, but you need to understand the difference between the freedom of operate and patentability, right? Patentability is that how much your idea cannot be replicated by another. They have to spend a lot of time and effort and they have to find out a different real way to solve this problem. And you make sure nobody is solving the problem in this way. That's, that's, that's a patentable. And you have to understand, when, even when you take a patent, you have to understand what else other patents that you're using and how much freedom they are giving you to operate on top of that build something else. So this is a crucial factor. If a company is going for a uh, Intel IP case, it's better you get a top-notch IP layer, IP lawyer, right? Not just lawyers, spe specialized intellectual property and software lawyers. And it, it's, it's not the right place to save because you have to spend a lot on getting the intellectual property because if you get an intellectual property, your business is huge. You know what is that, right? And um, then this business model and the market potential. This is another important thing. Most of the time we go with ideas, right? But in the healthcare industry, the ideas won't work. That I said to you in the first screen, there are 780,000 companies in the uh, US. Whatever the problem you take, there is a solution, there is a startup, there is a Kickstarter, there is some funding is going, there is a team working on that. So, so you cannot go with an idea, right? You have to go with a practical solution and some kind of a market potential. You have to work with some customers. This is from the beginning I am enforcing the team uh, who are coming to your like, idea. Never come with an idea. I, ideas doesn't make sense. It's the execution. What you can do. What kind of a team you have, right? This is the next thing. An experienced team. When it comes to medtech, it's not just a, a job. A set of engineers can cannot sit together and solve a problem. You really need different areas of people. There's one of the problem these teams in the Yale IT Hub has. So all IT people, right? We need the um, accounting side people. We need from people from healthcare specialty. We need people from education. We need people from agri agriculture with the, their industry knowledge, right? So if you are going with the med, med tech uh, solution, most of the time you need some kind of understanding of what is the medical thing behind it because it's a totally different subject. It is not like an online solution, online sales, or it is not like a... Um, education management system where you can experience from their side, your customer side, what the customer really needs, right? If you want to do an online selling platform, you can assume that you are a kind of online shopping person and what kind of a solution you want. But in, in the medic, medic, med tech, you cannot assume that you are a doctor and you cannot figure out what you really want. You really need a doctor or somebody with the medicinal background to tell you what you're doing is right. So this is very important when it comes to medtech. And as I told you, when it comes to this business model market potential, it, it's better to come up with partnership, right? You cannot, sometimes it's very difficult to get a customer if you are a startup or a new idea, right? So you cannot go with the new idea to the medtech uh, med industry and say, uh, buy this one. Nobody's going to buy something from a startup. There, there is a big entry barrier for startup companies. This, this startup, the, the healthcare professionals are much afraid of startups, right? Nobody wants the startup coming and telling something. They want a well-tested, proven uh, solution with a history of experience of the company. That's what they want. So as a startup, if you want to get into medtech, you have to find a way how can you identify an unmet need and strategically partner with the customer, right? Ask the customer to partner with you. At that time, you need to understand what's the difference between customers and partners, right? 
partner is someone who can build something with you and they can give you the complementary knowledge from their side maybe you are the tech guy or maybe you are kind of a guy who can do the intellectual property and that side your partner can be a doctor or a hospital or kind of a, a medical assistant who can give you the medical view of this thing and then both of you can together build something right this is one of the interesting fact when it comes to a startup coming into medtech so you have to start with the uh, strategic partnership and understand how you can get somebody that can complement your knowledge as a partner and join and build something then make them customers and then find the synergy so how you can make a business out of that and get such different people and expand your business so these are the points from my side uh, for the teams coming for Yalit Hub. Uh, I hope I make sense, Sabana. Yes, dear Krishnan, that was indeed very valuable points as well. So uh, the attendees here today, if you all have any questions, you may ask now. Uh, you can either post it on the Q and A uh, panel, or you can raise your hand so that we can unmute you. Uh, so looks like there are no questions so then uh, with that uh, i think we can wind up the session uh, for the day so uh, i would like to thank uh, professor indran and uh, jay krishnan for taking time of their busy schedule and being here to share their uh, knowledge and experience uh, in the mid tech field uh, which i'm sure our audience here and the viewers uh, might uh, pick on and then try to work on those areas and i would also like to thank our audience uh, uh, viewers here and the participants for joining this session looking forward to see y'all uh, in yet another uh, webinar of the ygc 10 explore series thank you everyone take care and stay safe thank you